My name is Talal Tabba. I'm one of the co-founders of Gibral Network. Uh, we're a blockchain development company that focuses on tokenizing financial assets, or placing traditional financial assets onto the Ethereum blockchain. So what we do at Gibral is we combine the advantages of cryptocurrencies with the advantages of traditional financial assets. So Gibral has been part of the Enterprise Ethereum Alliance for just about a year now. Um, we're also part of several other initiatives and associations that combine the incumbent financial institutions, the fintech startups like ourselves, lawyers and regulators. For example, we just graduated from the DIFC's FinTech Accelerator program, which was phenomenal. Basically, the whole concept of such associations or uh, accelerators is to put everyone on the same table, whether it's the end user, which is most likely the bank, as well as the service provider, which is ourselves in this case. If only two companies were using the internet, you really cannot benefit from it. Uh, if Facebook had three users, no one would access it. Uh, same applies to blockchain or any really scalable technology. Uh, blockchain in its current state stands to benefit specific problems, uh, but going forward 10 years down the line, it'll be something that we don't even think about. So for example, today you don't really say which business is, a, is an internet business. Internet is part of our daily lives, it connects businesses to one another. Uh, the same will apply to blockchains, but that is on how data is stored. So, 10 years down the line, anything that requires reconciliation, uh, anything that requires data to be shared by two parties will most probably sit on some type of blockchain. At Gibral, we're proud to be the world's first company to design a smart contract that mimics the Sukuk, which is an Islamic debt instrument. Uh, we, again, were lucky to work with a leading bank such as Hilal, Al Hilal Bank, which had a team that was very progressive and understanding of this technology. Uh, basically, in the debt capital markets um, around the world, processes are highly convoluted, complicated, and require several intermediaries. Um, what we aim to do is to basically automate processes that are largely manual, uh, and we were able to successfully do that working with Al Hilal Bank, uh, where we did a portion of their uh, sukuk in the form of a smart contract. Uh, so today, for example, the profit payments of a sukuk or any security really happens mostly in a, in a manual manner or, or could happen in a digital manner, but it's not automated. And what we do in our smart sukuk is basically we automate all cash flows associated with any security. I think there are several obstacles towards blockchain adoption, and I think the most important one is education. Uh, humans always fear things that they don't understand or don't know. Um, and it's something that we've seen not only in the Middle East, but on a global scale. For example, if you look at banks such as BBVA, who are considered one of the leaders when it comes to blockchain adoption, they were one of the first to hire um, experts in this field that would explain to the rest of the employees at the bank how the system works and how this technology works. Uh, so I think education is probably the biggest obstacle. Second would be federal level regulations. And when I say federal level, uh, ADGM have been very progressive by launching a crypto regulatory framework, uh, but, but we still live uh, in, in a country or a region that is pr primarily uh, regulated by central banks. The only central bank in the region to have proposed proper crypto regulations is the Central Bank of Bahrain. Uh, it's believed that the Central Bank of the UAE will be coming out with regulations soon, uh, but until that happens, it will remain an obstacle. Finally, I think there is... Um, so whenever you're dealing with blockchain, you have to, uh, there's a very important link between real world ownership and a digital asset. For example, if we take this hotel that we're sitting in now and we represent its ownership in the form of a token and the real owner of the hotel goes to the Dubai land department and sells the piece of real estate, then you're left with a token that is worthless because the underlying asset uh, is, is no longer there. So figuring out how to link your underlying asset with a digital token is an extremely important uh, obstacle that we've overcome at Gibral from a technology point of view. It's now just about convincing the regulator to accept that token or the digital asset as mean of ownership. Uh, this can be replicated across securities, cash, commodities, equities, and real estate. The private sector has to work with the public sector and the government in order to get things rolling. So, in order to 
pursue that, we basically took part in the Central Bank of Jordan's regulatory fintech sandbox. We took part in the DFSA's innovation testing license cohort, the Abu Dhabi uh, General Markets ADGM um, fintech sandbox, so, and as well as applying to the ESCA, uh, which is the Securities and Commodities Authority fintech application. So by doing so, these regulators slash government entities have created this sandbox environment or a separate type of license that doesn't fit into existing frameworks. We're taking this new technology and try to fit it within the existing infrastructure. Um, and then at some point, we'll face something called technology infrastructure inversion. That's when the regulator realizes that there, this is new technology or a new type of asset that can't fit into the existing frameworks. And that's when they create a new type of framework that fits that. Expecting governments to align on blockchain or digital asset policies is not very reasonable. Uh, probably tax uh, is, is one of the only things that countries in the GCC have been able to, uh, to be unified on. Um, whereas if you look at any other type of, of, of government regulations, they're not really the same. So to expect them to have a unified policy around digital assets is kind of ambitious. Uh, but the reality is that a UAE bank is governed by the laws of the UAE Central Bank. A bank in Bahrain is governed by its respective regulator. So we actually don't really care about having one, uh, let's say, policy or regulation across the whole region. What we care about is when we work with a UAE regulated bank to comply with the specific or relevant uh, regulations. In order to have, again, unified policies, we need projects and real-world adoption to drive that. One project that I salute, or one effort that I salute, is the UAE and Central Bank of Saudi. Uh, they're working on a project called Aber, uh, and Aber basically aims to um, allow for instant reconciliation and settlement between UAE and Saudi banks. Once we start realizing the benefits of projects such as Aber, this will trickle down. So when central banks are using this technology and they use it in an efficient manner, that will push the private sector to do the same in the terms of licensed banks. That will also trickle down to, to fintech companies and it will be part of the economy, I guess. So as, as a final thought, I would urge all banks in the UAE and GCC and across the world to test out this technology in a closed environment, in a way that de-risks anything around their reputation, their operations, their cybersecurity, but still allows them to figure out whether this technology is just hype or can it really improve how they do business. Um, whether it's for remittances, for debt issuance, uh, for, credit uh, for credit scoring, and many other applications, I urge all banks to test this out. Uh, check out Gibral.network uh, for more information. Thank you.